Well, thank you, Shauna, for the good patriotic music on this 4th of July weekend. We're glad you're all able to be here. For some of you, this is your second week. It's, it's like home already. Some of you, this is your first week, and we're glad you're here to, to worship with us. And if you're a visitor today, again, we extend a very, very special welcome to, to each of you. But we're glad you're here to join us. Uh, a few things I, w I would mention again uh, as you leave. We ask that you be sure to take anything that you have in, in the pew with you, and we'll be kind of cleaning things afterwards. There's a little insert in the bulletins that we're not passing friendship folders. We'd like to ask you to fill that out, and each family could even just fill one out and list the people. So we just have a record of attendance, and we drop that in the offering box uh, by the, the uh, pho or, uh, not phone booth out there, the uh, <laughs> audio booth as, as you leave, the, the box is there. So we encourage you to do that. <clears throat> We'd also remind you that if parents, if you have some, some infants or young children, if you feel a need to leave, feel free to go out the back door. And if you go to the left, uh, there's a room over there, a side room. There's a TV in there. There's a uh, speaker, you can continue to watch the service there in the privacy of that. So, so feel free to make use of that if you need to. would also remind you that today, uh, the Presbyterian folks who are where we bought the building from, they are continuing to meet. They started this Sunday, their first Sunday. They're going to be meeting down in the basement. In fact, they're, they're meeting right now. They started at 10 o'clock. So just wanted to let you know that. So if you see people come in the west door or, or in between services, if you ever come to the first service, we want to be sure not to go downstairs. They'll be down there for a while. And, and so we want to be respectful of them as they, they continue to worship now as well. Uh, this is the last Sunday for the Pregnancy Service Center baby bottles. If you've got one of those to turn in, there's a... a basket right outside the, the door coming in, and you can turn that in. Also, I'd remind you, uh, this Wednesday night, the midweek manna, since we don't have adult Sunday school right now, I've been doing a study of 1 Peter. We finished 1 Peter last week. This, this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock, it will come on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. I'm going to start the book of 2 Peter. We're going to stay with the same author and just move to a different book. He changes his, his themes and his thinking a little bit as he gets to the book of 2 Peter. So I encourage you to join us for that study. As so we come today in Psalm 95, the psalmist tells us, O oh, come, let us sing for joy to our Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Would you bow with me as we come to the Lord? Father, we thank you that as we come into your presence, we have Jesus Christ as our good shepherd, the one who has called us, the one who cares for us, the one who meets our needs, the one who grants us salvation. Lord, we thank you that we are part of his flock through Jesus Christ. And as we come to worship you today, we pray that we would give honor and praise back to our good shepherd, the one who has called us. And Lord, we thank you for your word that you have blessed us with, the encouragement we can draw from it. But we also desire to sing songs of praise, to lift up your name, and to praise the person of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Um, we just celebrated our independence as a country and our freedom. So let's celebrate our freedom in Jesus Christ. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed. Great. 
that we have the freedom to proclaim the powerful name of Jesus. And not only can we say the name of Jesus Christ with all authority, but that we have freedom because of Jesus Christ. We have freedom from our sins, freedom from our chains. We just are so grateful for that, Father, that we have a peace and a hope that surpasses all understanding because of the grace that we have through Jesus Christ. Your word says in Romans 5, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And Father, we are so grateful that not only did you send your son to die for our sins on the cross, to take on our sufferings, but that you've also left us with the Holy Spirit, our comforter, our helper, our advocate. We just thank you so much, Father, for all the blessings. And it's in your son, Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Thank you. 
Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. That's your word. Lord, the word that is preached this morning, Lord, that it would not come to us, Lord, just in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Lord, that is our hearts, Lord, that that you would speak to us, Lord, through your word, that you would turn our lives around, as the song says, that you would change our hearts, that you would heal our hearts, that you would do what only you can do, not in word only, Lord, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. That is our prayer this morning, Lord God. For it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning. Y'all are looking good this morning. Well, last week I began looking at the Holy Spirit, Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit, and we talked a little bit about the Spirit's role in in comforting and commissioning the disciples after Jesus ascends back to his Father in heaven. In short, the Holy Spirit will be another helper for them. He will be as Jesus was to them after Jesus is gone physically. And the Spirit's main job would would be to, to point to Christ, to illuminate His words. And we said that after Pentecost, the Spirit was not only going to be with them, but He would be in them. He would dwell in them. But I want to pause for a Sunday and give a very brief overview of just who the Holy Spirit is, and what exactly He does. Because it's important for us to be clear about what the Scriptures teach us regarding the Spirit's nature and work. Over the centuries, and especially in comparatively modern times, there have been much confusion and misunderstanding Surrounding the Holy Spirit and what He does and how the church is to respond to Him. I personally have encountered and seen the gamut of responses to the Holy Spirit in the churches that I have gone to and served in over the years. From all all out, out of balance fanaticism to almost ignoring the Holy Spirit altogether. And I am persuaded that neither extreme is healthy. And it's my prayer that we will have a right understanding of this third person of the Godhead and know how to properly think about Him and respond to Him. And I am convinced that the only way To have that is to go humbly and honestly to the Scriptures. To set aside our preconceptions and traditions. And receive what God Himself has taught us. And so with that as our commitment this morning. The first thing I want us to look at this morning is what Scripture has to say about the person of the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit. Now, now, right off the bat, I want to say that this is a very different kind of sermon that, than what I normally preach. Normally, I take the next passage of Scripture and the book that we're studying and develop my sermon from that. But today, we're seeking to answer two questions. Who is the Holy Spirit and what does He do? And so, my message is going to be based more on what's called a topical or systematic approach. That is, I will be collecting 
what the entire Bible has to say about the Holy Spirit and breaking it up into concise and understandable teachings from God's Word regarding who He is and what He does. Now, I'm going to be, especially in this first part of the message, I'm going to be citing a lot of passages, kind of, you know, shotgun. Don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about, you know, get them all done or memorizing any of them. Just listen. And then if you want those, those passages you know, uh, to have and look up later, please contact me and I will make sure that you get them, okay? <clears throat> and the first thing that we notice when we do this, though, is that the Holy Spirit has many biblical names. Scripture refers to the Holy Spirit using various names, some having to do with His relationship with the Father. And some... With the Son. And then there are various personal titles. For instance, in looking at the Holy Spirit in relation to the Father, we see in Genesis 1-2, it calls Him the Spirit of God. Luke 4-18 calls Him the Spirit of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 6-11, it says that He is the Spirit of our God. And 2 Corinthians 3-3 calls Him the Spirit of the living God. Furthermore, the Father refers to the Holy Spirit as my Spirit in Genesis 6-3. Then there are names for the Holy Spirit that refer to His re relationship to Christ. Romans 8-9 calls Him the Spirit of Christ. In Philippians 1.19, he is the spirit of Jesus Christ. Galatians 4.6 refers to him as the spirit of his son. And in Acts 5.9, he is referred to as the spirit of the Lord, referring to Christ. And finally, there are many varying personal titles that scripture uses to refer to the Holy Spirit. In fact, in many places... He is simply called the Holy Spirit. Romans 1.4 refers to him as the spirit of holiness, while 1 John 2.20 calls him the Holy One. In Hebrews 9.14, he is the eternal spirit. And in Romans 8.2, he is called the spirit of life. And finally, we just saw here in John chapters 14 through 16 that he is called the comforter or the helper or the advocate and the spirit of truth. Now, as you may, may have noticed, I have been using the pronoun he when referring to the Holy Spirit and not it. That is because scripture shows us that he is a person. He is a person. Now, what do we mean that he is a person? Well, we certainly don't mean that he's human. We oftentimes equate personhood with being human, but that's not correct. Humans are persons because they have been made in the image of God, not the other way around. Yet we can understand the idea of personhood since we are personal beings ourselves. And this gets to some of the reasons why humans are indeed separate from the animal kingdom or from the inanimate objects. And this contrast is helpful to us in thinking about God and, and more specifically the Holy Spirit. He is not an impersonal force, but a person. He is a personal being. For instance, we can have communion with him. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul writes about the communion or fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The scripture speaks of the Spirit as being pleased about something in Acts 15, 28, when the apostles say, it seemed good to us, to the Holy Spirit, and to us. 
In Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead for lying to the Holy Spirit. You can't lie to an impersonal force, but a person. In Acts 1, 16, 8, 29, and 13, 2, the Scripture says that the Spirit speaks. Scripture also attributes other personal qualities to the Holy Spirit, such as knowledge in 1 Corinthians 2.11. The Spirit has a will and makes decisions in 1 Corinthians 12.11. In Romans 8.26-27, it says that He intercedes for us. And in Ephesians 4.30, it says that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Now, recognizing the Holy Spirit as a person and not a force will affect how we think about Him and how we interact with Him. If we are believers, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And as I showed last week, that means God Himself dwells within us and can be communed with and called upon for help. And that brings us to another important truth about who the Holy Spirit is. And that is the fact that He is God. He is God. Now, I'm not going to belabor this point because we've talked about this already, about the Trinity and the fact that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, while three distinct persons, are one in their very essence, all being one God. And time will not allow me, and you'll be happy for that, <laughs> to give an exhaustive accounting of the scriptures uh, that allude to the Spirit's deity. But I will mention a few, though. In Acts 5, 1 through 4, Peter says that, that Ananias and Sapphira have lied to the Holy Spirit. And in the very next sentence, it says that they have lied to God. Acts 28, 25 attributes to the Holy Spirit what God had spoken through the Old Testament prophets that the Holy Spirit had written, had spoken through the prophets. In Hebrews 9, 14, it says that the, the Spirit is, is eternal. And we know that only God is eternal. And this doesn't even take into account the many references in Scripture to the Holy Spirit being associated with the other members of the Trinity and doing what only God can do, such as creating, regenerating, and sanctifying, which we will look at in a minute. But nor do we have time to list the many instances in Scripture where the Holy Spirit is referred to as having the exact same attributes as God. And that brings us to the final two considerations we will look at today regarding the person of the Holy Spirit. And these considerations have to do with His very name. First is the truth that He is holy. He is holy. As God, the Holy Spirit has all the attributes of God. There is no attribute of God that the Holy Spirit does not have. And maybe the chiefest of these is the fact that He is holy. He is the Holy Spirit. That means that as God, He is completely glorious, completely pure, and completely separate from sin in all that He is and all that He does. I bring this up specifically because I've seen many things attributed to the Holy Spirit that have actually had their origination from the flesh or the wisdom of man. And yet we must remember that the Holy Spirit will never, will never act in, a, in any way apart from complete holiness with completely holy purposes and never with fleshly intent. 
And then finally, we must understand the concept that He is spirit. He is spirit. Now I bring this up because of the many references in Scripture which are associated with the breath of God or to the wind of God. Those words in, in both Hebrew and Greek are they're, they're interchangeable with the word spirit. The Hebrew word ruach and the Greek word pneuma both are translated spirit and breath and wind. One very clear example of this is from John's Gospel in John 3.8 where Jesus says to Nicodemus, The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And there's also the idea of the breath of God being very closely associated with the Word of God. Breath and speech working hand in hand as one accomplishing God's purposes here on earth. And that leads us right into the second thing we want to consider today. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. Now, while the study of the person of the Holy Spirit is more foundational for us to know as we continue to study Him. The work of the Holy Spirit gets us into the neighborhood of what we see concentrated on in John's Gospel. And so what I would like to do is to look at nine of the Spirit's main works that we, want, that we find throughout Scripture. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is a very brief overview, yet... It's a very important overview, though, that will serve as a preface to all that we will be looking at going forward in chapters 14, 15, and 16 of of John's gospel, and how we can understand more readily and recognize the importance of how the Spirit's work fits into God's overall plan of redemption. But even before we get to redemption, though, the very first thing that we see in Scripture regarding the Holy Spirit's work is that He is the agent of creation. He is the agent of creation. In the creation account at the very beginning of Genesis, we are told that that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. I I love that picture. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the words, the the waters, waiting for for the, the word to be spoken. The original Hebrew here is Ruach Elohim, literally the breath of the Almighty. And what we see from this is that the Spirit was not only present in the creation, but He was the very power of God to create. God the Father purposed, the Word was the means, and the Spirit was the one who applied the power of God that brought all things into being. But when we come to a passage such as 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6, we see a direct reference to the Spirit's work in creation paralleled with what He does in salvation through the gospel. And this is when we learn that the Holy Spirit is not just the agent of creation, but He is the agent of new creation in Christ. He is the agent of new creation in Christ. As God spoke and everything was created. God also speaks and we become new creations. 2 Corinthians 4.6 says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, 
has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. You see that parallel. And this is something that is so prevalent in John's gospel regarding the work of regeneration. Now again, regeneration is when God causes us who were spiritually dead to come alive in Christ Jesus. And this is the work of the Spirit. Titus 3, 5 through 6 says, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but, because, but, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The Holy Spirit is the author of the new birth. We see this so clearly in John 3, 5. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The Spirit is the one who works through the Word to open blind eyes, reveal the truth to our hearts, convicts us of sin, gives us faith to believe, and then He unites us with Christ and places us into the body of Christ. And then third, after He makes us new, we see that He gives us assurance. He gives us assurance that we are God's children. Romans eight fourteen through 16 tells us, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you, do, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So He gives us assurance. Fourth, He is the author of the Scriptures. Now, I certainly don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this, except for us to see, see this in the context of all that we're talking about. We see in 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21, that, 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 that although God used human agents to pen the words of Scripture, those human agents were not the ultimate authors of the words. Peter says, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is the ultimate author of the words of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says that all Scripture is breathed out by God. And again, we have the use of, of the breath of God being spoken of here. But it's interesting that we have this picture of, of, of words and breath coming out of God's mouth as He spoke His Word. Because we know that whenever God speaks, that's when things happen. That's when lives are changed. That's when people are set free. As God said through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my words be that goeth out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God has purposed for His Word to accomplish something, and it's the Holy Spirit that does the accomplishing through the Word. And may I say 
This is precisely, folks, why we at this church see such a great need to be faithful to the Word of God in our preaching, in our teaching, and in everything that we do. Since the Word was authored by the Holy Spirit, He will always, listen, since the Word was authored by the Holy Spirit, He will always accomplish God's purposes through that written Word. And cause the word of God to go out as more than just words on a page. But with the power to change people's lives. Again, we see this so clearly in 1 Thessalonians 1.5. Our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. As a matter of fact, I would like you, church, to memorize that scripture. 1 Thessalonians 1.5. I I would like you to memorize this scripture and, and incorporate this scripture into your prayers for this church and for the, the, the gospel ministry. 1 Thessalonians 1.5. Fifth. In keeping with the Holy Spirit's work through the Word, we see that through that Word, He teaches and illumines. He teaches and illumines. And folks, this is one of the most exciting aspects of the the Spirit's work to me as a pastor. Especially as a pastor, and yet this is available to everyone, every believer who seeks it. Have you, ever, have you ever been reading the Bible and suddenly a passage just jumps out at you and the light goes on and you see it as if you're seeing it for the first time and something happens in your heart. You're convicted of a sin. You receive needed instruction or wisdom for a problem, and suddenly the, the, the passage causes you to see God as you've never seen Him before, and you, you know Him. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We looked at this last week a bit when, and why He is called the Spirit of Truth. He takes the written word of God and illuminates its truths to us. And and this is a supernatural thing. It's not just just acquiring head knowledge. It's a supernatural work. He actually shines light into our hearts. Now, a word of warning here, folks. A word of warning. Not every time you get an epiphany about something that you're reading in the Bible, is it necessarily the Holy Spirit? Again, since He is the author of the Word of God, He will act and speak only according to and in perfect agreement with the written Word of God, what He has said throughout the whole Scripture. And that is why being faithful to read and study the Scriptures is so important. And why Ephesians 4 11 through 12 says that Jesus gave the church gifts of pastors and and teachers whom the Holy Spirit enables to help as well. And that brings us to the sixth work of the Holy Spirit, the fact that He gives gifts to the church. He gives gifts to the church. Now, I will probably take a whole Sunday and talk about this in the very near future. But there are various kinds of spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to the church and to believers for various purposes. Two of the main areas of Scripture in which we find these is Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14. But all of them are for the benefit of building up the body of Christ and the advancement of the gospel. 
And that leads us right into the seventh work of the Spirit, the fact that He empowers for service. He empowers for service. Now, once again, we as believers are called to the same ministry of reconciliation by which we have been reconciled to God ourselves. We were reconciled to God and then we're called to that same ministry of reconciliation. We are commissioned to go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations. But as I've said many times, we preach the gospel... But we can't change one life, can we? we? We do our part to preach the gospel, but I can't change anybody's life. God must do that. And so not only does God give us the strength to minister in his name, but he also empowers our ministry, our preaching, our loving others, accomplishing through us what only he can accomplish. The eighth work of the Holy Spirit is that he sanctifies and purifies. He sanctifies and purifies. God's whole purpose in redemption is to redeem a people for himself from out of the sinful world to make them his own people called by his name and sanctify them to become more and more like Christ and less and less like the sinful world. And folks, this is a lifelong process. From the moment we come to Christ to the moment we see him face to face. The Holy Spirit is always in the process of making us holy. That is making us separated from the world unto God. And the way he does this is he convicts us of sin. He gives us grace for repentance. He reveals to us what is true and gives us grace to obey the truth of God's word. Ephesians 5 commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is, we should be continually surrendered to and under the influence of the indwelling spirit in our lives. And then we see in Galatians 5.22, that that in those who learn to walk in the Spirit, He will produce the fruit of the Spirit. Again, that's Galatians chapter 5, verses 20 through 22, worth checking out. And when we look into the perfect mirror of God's Word, and see that our lives fall short, we can call upon the Lord for the Spirit's help. We can call upon the Lord for the Spirit's help to make us look more and more like the Word of God that we're reading. And that brings us to the final work of the Holy Spirit that we will be looking at this morning, the fact that He intercedes and helps us pray. He intercedes... And helps us pray. Romans 8, 26. In speaking of enduring the present troubles that we're currently enduring. And looking ahead to the future glory that we are promised. It says the spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And this is where I want to end this morning. And it happens to be both the most practical and one of the most needful issues in this hour. As someone once said, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can't do more than pray until 
you've prayed. Folks, I know. I know how difficult it is sometimes to be faithful in prayer. I do. I get it. I get it. It's it's a struggle sometimes. I get it. But if you are a Christian and you're not praying, then you might as well not be breathing. When we think of all the stuff that we're seeing in the world today in our and in our nation and the, the, the overwhelmingness of voices and differing of opinions and flared tempers, all the injustice and all the, the other junk that we encounter in this broken world that we live in, as we await the day of Christ's return, I want to remind us, church, once again of the privilege that we have of coming to God in prayer. And the language that we see here in Romans 8, 26 makes this issue very relatable to us. It makes us very, the language here, it talks about our, our weakness. It talks about groanings, not having words, not knowing what to pray for, yet ever feeling that you ought to be praying. Has anybody felt that way? But our problem, hear me, our problem comes when we feel the need to vent those feelings and frustrations in every way except the one way that God has given us that will actually make a difference. Did did you hear what I said? Our problem comes when we feel the need to vent those feelings and frustrations in every way except the one way that God has given to us that will actually make a difference. And that's prayer. Folks, if you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And I want you to know that God has given us not only an avenue to vent those feelings, but a helper that will make sure that our groanings, when directed to God, when directed to God, are turned into the right prayers to our loving Heavenly Father who is able to do abundantly more than what we could ever ask or think. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Folks, I want to, in lieu of a closing prayer this morning, I would like to share a song with you that is a prayer. So I invite you not necessarily to sing along, but to pray along. to come alive in me give me faith for what I cannot see give me passion for your purity Holy Spirit breathe new life in me
Lord, may that be our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful afternoon.